Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we are a couple minutes from starting, so come on in, grab a seat, and we'll get started for today's session here in a couple of minutes. Thanks everyone for for joining. Oh yeah, we got a lot of people joining. All right, uh, shout out where you're uh, calling in from in the uh, in the comments. We usually get a decent amount of uh, coverage across the the continents, kind of depending on the time of day. So I'm curious to see where where people are dialing in from. Denmark, Peoria, Illinois. I'm in Illinois as well. Toronto, the Netherlands. There we go. Dubai, Mexico. Antler office in Texas. There we go. <laughs> New Zealand, Calgary. This is awesome. Boston, we got people from everywhere. Fantastic. Uh, we're gonna give it two more minutes, uh, let people come on in. Germany, Brussels, Brazil. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll get started here in, in just one or two minutes. The Arctic Circle, Washington, DC, Singapore. And this is amazing. Probably our biggest distribution yet. Uh, one more minute and then we'll get started in the dark side of the moon. Very nice. And we'll... Uh, We'll uh, we'll get started. Um, we'll uh, we'll record this and send this out. Uh, we'll we'll have our team monitoring questions as well. We'll get into all that good stuff. But this is definitely being recorded. If you need to jump off or miss the part, we'll make sure to send it out to everyone in the next couple of business days. We'll do a recap log as well that everyone will get uh, access to. Kenya, fantastic. Nice. Vancouver, BC. I love Vancouver. I lived in Seattle for for a bit. Um, cool. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, thanks everyone for for joining. Uh, we're really just excited to talk about fundraising, crafting your story, how fundraising shifted and changed uh, the second half of this year, how it might uh, affect things next year. I want to make sure we introduce our, our awesome guest. Uh, and so without further ado, um, first would love just to introduce Tyler. Um, some of you might know Tyler because we're doing this webinar with Antler. Tyler is a managing partner um, of Antler here in the United States. Uh, he works with over um, 135 different pre-seed founders and their fundraising strategies, subsequent fellow one rounds, coached them through that entire process. Uh, prior to being a managing partner here in the U.S., Tyler was also a partner in Antler Singapore, uh, also an Ironman athlete. And I saw you had a side gig of growing microgreens for chefs in Colorado. That's <laughs> impressive. Yeah, I've uh, done a lot of different things in life. I think the underlying thread is I always try to do the the most challenging thing that I can possibly think of. Um, and uh, running a VC and helping founders uh, raise capital is one of those things. So really excited to be here, Mike. And uh, thanks a lot for putting this together and uh, pumped to jump in and talk about fundraising. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we also have Robbie uh, from Antler. Uh, Robbie has, I think, a very different background than what you would usually see. He was a trial lawyer uh, before coming to the world of startups. Uh, he also worked as a program director with OnDeck, where he worked closely with the OnDeck founders, uh, helping prepare fundraising pitches, uh, their decks, and really ma mastered the idea of conversational storytelling. Uh, he's now a venture partner as well with Antler and joined in, in 2022, uh, really just really helping founders craft their story, which we're going to spend uh, a, a decent amount of our time today talking about. Um, and yeah, Robbie, thanks for for joining and, and welcome to the to the show. Yeah, thanks. Mike, like uh, Tyler said, I think it's it's a fun time to be talking about fundraising and storytelling. And there's uh, there's a lot of anxiety and I think nervousness out there. And it'll be fun to to bring some of what we see working to everybody here and, and really dive into it. Fantastic. Uh, and for those of you that don't know myself, my name's Mike. Uh, I'm one of the I'm the founder of Visible. Started Visible eight years ago. We'll get into a little bit about what Visible does and what Antler does, and, and get into the content. Um, but yeah, I started Visible in 2015. Um, Visible has been profitable since 2017, which is kind of ironic given um, the idea of, of fundraising and capital in our, in our customers. But we oriented the business around you know, really just giving founders a better chance of success and, and wanted to make sure we didn't have to be relying on, on outside capital for that. Um, very similar to Antler, we operate worldwide. Uh, we have founders in 47 countries. Uh, we have 350 different investment funds using Visible. And over 3,500 founders use Visible every single month to provide updates uh, and manage their fundraising process and, and manage the different investor uh, relationships. 
And then I'm going to do a, uh, I'm going to highlight Antler here and, and Robbie and uh, Tyler, please jump in if I, if I miss anything. Uh, but Antler was founded back in 2018 and is one of the largest and most active early stage investors in the world. Uh, Antler works with over 900 companies uh, with total portfolio value of over $4.3 billion. Uh, they're also in six continents uh, with 27 different locations, over 6,000 founders, 144 different founder nationalities. Um, and just they've been an amazing partner to Visible in, in our partnership over the last uh, three or so years. I also want to plug that they have a, a new residency kicking off in October, October 10th. Uh, we'll make sure to send the link out with this after if you're looking to join the Antler program. And um, there's also an Ask Me Anything tomorrow uh, that you can join uh, to learn more about Antler as well. Uh, but I have nothing just but amazing things to say about the entire Antler team and and founders and the the entire community they've built. They've been a, a, an amazing partner to us. Um, anything, Tyler or Robbie, you guys want to make sure I uh, that's that's plugged here as well? No, I think that's great, Mike. Um, like you said, I mean, happy to be partnering with Visible. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, as you can see, we've uh, been hard at work uh, building Antler since 2018 across the world. So uh, I think one of the most exciting things about us partnering with early stage founders, especially is, you know, we're a startup ourselves. We're not just a fund sitting on a big pile of money, sitting behind a computer, deciding who to distribute to. Um, so we're learning and growing as we go. And uh, I think we're the most relevant investor for early stage founders because we're in the trenches ourselves. And I think that makes a big difference um, in the community and just the applicability of the, the lessons and the support that we're providing. So um, yeah, pumped to dive in and talk about fundraising. Fantastic. Yes. And uh, Bell and our team are standing by. Uh, if you guys have any questions, let me get some, some housekeeping here. Uh, please just use Zoom chat if you have questions. Uh, I'll try to weave those in uh, real time if it, if it makes sense, or uh, we'll do a Q&A at the end with any extra time. Um, and we'll also have this recording because that always gets asked. This is going to be recorded. Uh, we'll send this out through everyone that registered today. You should receive that within uh, the next one or two uh, business days. But let's get to the content. Uh, I think that's everyone. why everyone's here. We're going to talk about the fundraising landscape, how to plan for your fundraise, uh, how you can leverage investor updates for that fundraise. Um, stay, really using storytelling is this idea of how you can stand out and, and differentiate yourself in your in your company. Uh, we'll actually make sure to give a couple of free resources out at the end as well. Um, so let's get to this chart. I think this is probably the, the one thing that's on a lot of, of founders' minds. And I think something we hear you know every single day, which is, uh, you know, during COVID, we had this incredible um, boom when with funding dollars, and it seemed like it was, you know, I don't want to say easy, but it was um, much easier to close a funding round then than it is today. Um, we can kind of see that with the pitch book data here with the de deal value and, and deal counts. Tell her, I'm just curious, like, how have, how have you seen this play out, right? Because, you know, antler companies have gone through this cycle. You're helping companies that are just starting fundraise. Um, what, what have been your big takeaways this year, especially kind of the second half of, of, of this year as it relates to all things, just macro fundraising? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's obviously been a very exciting time in the venture capital world and like the alternative assets world as a whole. Um, we went through sort of a crazy period of huge volume and huge valuations um, throughout the COVID era. Um, I think what's becoming apparent now is that that wasn't normal and um we are now living in a return to normal um as opposed to like waiting to return to that era um so i think by all accounts you can classify what happened during the covid era as the end of uh, a 14 year long term credit cycle um and kind of two things happen at the end of a long term credit cycle Number one is all of the asset classes that were allowed to inflate uh, and kind of move away from intrinsic value. Uh, there's a period of repricing, um, and a lot of times it's very painful. Uh, we saw that happening in the public markets. Um, so as everyone on this call probably remembers, there was like the great B2B SaaS apocalypse. Um, so multiples on publicly traded SaaS companies came crashing down to the ground. Um, and I think the best way for founders to think about venture capital valuations is, you know, ultimately at the end of the private market venture capital 
valuations, you're attached to the public market. So public market multiples on companies like, you know, Google and, and Salesforce and, um, you know, some of the bad ones like Yahoo and whatever it is, <laughs> those ultimately sort of determine what the exit environment looks like for what we call growth stage, growth stage being, you know, series B and beyond. So when those public market valuations come crumbling down, obviously there's a huge effect on growth stage valuations and really deal flow, um, the number of deals that are getting done. Uh, and as, you know, growth stage starts coming down, it affects early stage because early stage is, you know, positioning itself to invest in early stage companies and then exit to growth stage or IPO. Um, so what we've seen over the past two-ish years now is those public market valuations coming back down to earth and slowly watching it precipitate through the private markets. Um, it doesn't happen quickly. The private markets are much, much slower than the public markets because they're not priced you know, on a second by second basis. Um, and from every stage, there's less and less of an impact. So what I think is really positive for founders is that pre-seed seed rounds are largely detached from the public markets. Um, they're many stages away from public market multiples. Um, and so I think the way to understand this chart for founders is really to appreciate the fact that like charts like this, we're lumping together many different stages of private market activity into one overall picture. The reality is that the disproportionate amount of decreased funding and decreased deal activity is happening at the growth stage, right? Series B and beyond. Like I talked about, that's obviously slowed down because, you know, as we know, the IPO market is pretty much closed. Uh, the valuations for IPOs are, are, are a lot worse than they have been previously. But as you get down into pre-seed and seed, um, the activity is still, um, I mean, from what we're seeing, I mean, we had in the first half of this year, 28 companies bring in term sheets at the seed stage. So seed is still very much alive. Um, and what I'll sh share with everyone um, and then wrap up, because I could ramble about this all day long, is I talked about what happens at the end of a credit cycle. Well, one thing is that valuations um, that are inflated need to come down. The second thing that happens at the end of a long-term credit cycle is a new long-term credit cycle starts. And so one of the things that happens there, and this is tricky because it seems like these are opposite activities, but they actually happen in parallel, is big institutional asset allocators. So ultimately where all the money for private venture comes from, they see an opportunity as well to invest in the next wave of startups. So they're doing two things simultaneously. One is shoring up later stage funds that haven't been performing well and, and you know, repricing positions that are probably less profitable than they thought. But at the same time, they're looking at, okay, this is now the time when the next generation of great startups is going to be started, right? And so they're actually allocating money into seed, into pre-seed. So Seed funds are getting additional capital from LPs. That means that they're going to continue writing checks into companies. And so the positive here is that the pre-seed and seed market for all the founders who are on this call at that stage is still very much alive. Uh, and we expect will be the first, the first stage to recover as we go into a, not, a new long-term credit cycle. So yeah, like I said, I could sit here and take up the entire webinar just talking about macro conditions, but I think those are a couple of useful bullet points to help founders understand uh, sort of the macro inputs that are affecting funding for uh, founders. Yes, Ray says, thank you for your optimism. I do as well. And I think you did an amazing job distilling down a pretty uh, complex topic, Tyler, into, into some actionable and, and thoughtful takeaways. I have one follow-up question and then a follow-up question for Robbie. Um, Tyler, what about like, there was stuff you mentioned the weight, uh, the repricing and and I think there was a certain amount of just waiting and seeing, right? I think investors um, kind of had a herd mentality sometimes and I was just kind of waiting and, and seeing what's going to happen. Uh, have you seen an inflection in one way or the other? Call it like, you know, today, September 26th, like that pre-seed seed, is it picking up compared to where it was maybe a quarter or two ago or a year ago? Is it still uh, relatively uh, flat compared to, to where it might have been in a previous quarter or previous year? Yeah, Um from our perspective, pre-seed and seed has com ha like has completed the repricing. So you know what we see now is um, the expectations on the traction that seed and pre-seed companies should have is generally starting to arrive at a pretty 
um, consistent place and the valuations anywhere from, you know, 12 to 20 million uh, are starting to arrive at a pretty stable place. And so from an optimistic viewpoint, I would say for the next five to six quarters, what we should expect is very sustainable growth of pre-seed, both number of deals, but also the amount of funding as an output of number of deals. So, I mean, by all accounts, I think it's the best time possible for founders to decide to start a company right now, um, because over the next you know, year and a half to two and a half, three years, I think we're going to see uh, a slow and sustainable increase in good pre-seed and seed funding. And when I say good, I mean, it's coming from quality funds that have survived this downturn and continue to raise capital, meaning that they're creating good returns. They're generally good actors. Like all the dumb money gets washed out in the end of these cycle periods. And number two, when I say good, is that the, the valuation and the structure of the deal is going to be good for founders. Um, I think ultimately, founders raising a seed round at 30, 40, 50 million dollars is actually really bad for the founders, right? It, it creates financial risk of like, if you don't grow in top decile of any startup to ever grow, ultimately your company is going to die because of the financing, not because of the underlying health of the business. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm very optimistic about the quality and the quantity of funding at the pre-seed seed to continue to increase over the next two to three years as we start to come out of this repricing exercise uh, and the market sort of starts to focus on the future. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> Robbie, I'll, I'll give you a chance to, to add anything there. And I guess one question as it relates to, to your expertise around storytelling, uh, is storytelling more or less important uh, for a company in the, in the current fundraising uh, environment? I mean, I'm gonna say it's, it's more important than ever because you have to get investors over that fear hurdle of what's happened in the past. And you have to get them out of looking at the past and more focused on where the future is going. And you're seeing some companies do this really well, especially in the AI space with all the changes that are coming there and what that potentially unlocks. So really what it comes down to from a storytelling perspective is can you refocus the attention from the elephant graveyard of the past, these poorly priced rounds that cause a lot of problems and get them focused, framed on where you can go and what the technology unlocks. And so that's going to be the biggest piece of the storytelling that needs to, needs to really shine through. And that is what we're seeing, especially companies who maybe are going out to raise like a series A, series B right now. A lot of them don't have the metrics that maybe investors are looking for at this point because it wasn't as, as harsh of a focus when they raised their seed to get to those metrics. Whereas now they're waking up and saying, it's a lot harder out there. And it is, it's harder at the series A, series B levels. But that means your storytelling, your visioning, and your explanation as to how you've de-risked it and what the reward is moving forward becomes more important. Because the only thing you can really sell on at that point is a vision of what you're going to be able to achieve in the future. You can't really point to metrics. You can't say, well, we only have X number in ARR. Like You've got to find a way to survive. And that comes down to the story. So that's why I say, especially for those A, B rounds, it's more important now than ever. Pre-seed and seed have more leeway now to build better metrics and traction to help them raise for future Series A's as the market kind of resettles. Awesome. Um, there's some great questions coming in uh, from Luke and, and Jurgen. We'll make sure to get to those. Uh, I, I got those written down. I think Tyler... You might have written that just to me and the panelists if yeah. you want to <laughs> put that over to everyone. So uh, we we answer uh, a couple of questions, but I want to make sure we get moving because we have a lot of other good content and we'll, we'll loop back to the questions here at the end. Um, I think one of the, the really under maybe appreciated uh, items of a good fundraise is really the planning for the fundraise and everything that goes into crafting your story, finding the right investors to reach out to, to managing your pipeline, to building relationships with investors and how long it's going to take. Um, I'm going to spend some time just helping orient founders think about the, the planning process and not just like jumping in and saying, yeah, I'm fundraising today. Um, and, and maybe Tyler, I got two, two questions for you to, to kick things off. And I mean, I'll just start with one here, which is like, when should a founder think about fundraising? Yeah. Um, I mean, look, like, unless you're sitting on a bunch of your own money and, you know, have 
50 million dollars to just do whatever you want in stealth and not talk to anybody else i mean i think fun founders should be thinking about it sort of from day one um uh, i think that there there's obviously a balance between bootstrapping and raising and uh, by no means am i an advocate of raising as much possible venture capital money as you possibly can i don't think raising VC money is a business model. Uh, there's a lot of businesses built over the last four or five years where like raising money was a business model and they weren't making any money doing anything else. Um, but if you're going to go out and build something large, um, it is going to take uh, investment. You are going to have to pay to bring on amazing people. Um, there is going to be variable costs depending on what your business model is. So I think the reality is you're going to have to raise you know, seed and probably a series A. I think beyond that is where you get a bifurcation of like, do we continue to raise, you know, hundreds and billions of dollars or do we focus on growing the company sustainably? Um, but in the beginning, I think you have to. Um, and so my recommendation is like, I think founders need to be thinking about this really from day one. Um, and like, I'll give you a really good example, um, Mike, because uh, I think a lot of founders think about fundraising as this thing that you like do and then stop doing and then you do and then you stop doing and the reality is it's 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 an important ongoing part of the business at all times just like any other functional area you don't you don't do finance and budgeting and FP&A once every three years and then just like turn it off and totally forget about it or else it would become a big disaster uh, and I think founders do that quite often so uh, a tangible example would be you know say Mike you and I um, we decided to start a company together in the climate space. Um, and, you know, we're thinking about the team that we need to build and the product and, you know, figuring out a wedge and who our first customers will be and how we go to market, et cetera. Um, at the same time, there's probably, let's say, a hundred really good climate VCs out there in the world. And so if our aspiration is to build a company that makes a big difference in the world and becomes sort of a darling in the climate space, at some point in the journey of our company, we're going to talk to all 100 of those VCs. Um, and to think that like, oh, we'll do that in four years or five years, et cetera. It's like, well, why not start now? Like those are the people you're going to be working with. And those are the people that are going to be meeting your competitors and sort of helping decide where capital is allocated um, within all the companies that are building in this space. Um, and I personally would go out as part of the getting the company off the ground phase of the business and start meeting them I'm saying, hey, look, my name's Tyler. I'm working with Mike. Um, we're planning on building a business in climate. Here's where we are right now. We don't have a product yet. We're still just figuring out who our initial customers are, but we know we want to build a fantastic company in the climate space. Uh, would love to chat, really respect the portfolio you've built in climate. We're not raising right now, but I just figured that at some point we're going to, you know, meet each other and why not start building that relationship right now? Uh, and so to take like a much more human approach to it versus a transactional approach uh, and to treat it as an ongoing function that you can be investing in, uh, I think is a really, really good mindset shift for founders to think about um, as they sort of venture into well, no pun intended, but venture into building a venture back startup. How, how do you balance that, that, uh, what you just said, Tyler, like you, you mentioned, uh, fundraising is not a business model, but you also said it's important from day one. Like how do I, how do I balance that versus like going and talking to my first hundred customers and in, in the first, you know, 90 days or potential customers in the first 90 days first you know, meeting those hundred investors, which can eat up a lot of cycles and, and maybe doesn't get you anywhere. Like, how do you think about balancing uh, the, 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 the two? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. So I think it's a really important question too, because that advice can often be taken at face value. And then founders are like, well, I wouldn't talk to, you know, a hundred VCs. And they all said my idea was stupid and I shouldn't do it. And so I think what's important is to separate that. You're not going to talk to these people for their validation, right? If you look at statistically venture capital, you know, every, every unicorn that's ever built, you know, 99% of VCs they ever met passed on the deal. So as a industry, we're actually really bad at choosing which businesses will work and which will not. So what I think is important is you're not going out and asking them, hey, do you think this is a good idea? You're not asking them for money. You're really not asking them to co-sign on what you're doing. You're sort of telling them like, we're going to build a successful company in the climate space. Because of that, we're going to know each other at some point. We might as well know each other now. And I would love to just hear your thoughts. And so I think it's important for founders to create the right 
intention with those meetings is I'm not asking you if this is a good idea or a bad idea. And I'm not judging whether or not we're doing the right things based on what VC, any random VCs are telling me. I'm building for my customers and I'm listening to what they want, right? But I'm building a human relationship with the VCs over time so that when I do need to go out and fundraise, I know them, they've seen that, you know, I, for example, do what I say I'm going to do, right? I'm, I'm building and telling a story. I mean, Mike, you mentioned in our pre-call, it's about creating lines, not dots. You know, when I yep. do go out to raise my seed and I've already spent the last six months, you know, every month sending an update to a VC, you know, having them on my, my visible list and showing them like, wow, every month these guys are just executing and growing and executing and growing. It's more about building a human relationship, not necessarily going out and trying to have VCs validate whether what you're working on is interesting or not. Yeah, that's awesome. That's 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 amazing advice. And um, I, I think everything you mentioned there is is spot on, right? It's all about just building relationships from uh, from day one, especially if we're if we're back to this, this is the 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 world in which we're operating in the fundraising process. Uh, investors are not going to invest in uh, in your company in the first interaction in the first meeting, right? There's going to be a uh, rapport and, and relationship that has to get to get built. Yeah. Um, Robbie, um, what about like the story I want to tell uh, as it relates to you know planning for my fundraise? Is that uh, I know we're we're going to touch on that um, in in a couple of slides, but like when should I think about the story? How should that story change over time? Do I need a story if I'm raising call it a, a pre seed round? Like where when and, and uh, should I start thinking about the the story I want to tell? Yeah, let's use let's use a couple frames of of reference here. Ben Horowitz says the story is a strategy. Steve Jobs says the most powerful person in the world is a storyteller. Michael Moritz talks about storytelling being critical for every founder. Don Valentin said the money flows as a result of the story. So we have these giants of industry who continue to say the story is critically important for a founder to be able to, to, to tell. So when should you be thinking about it? From day one. Because if you don't have a story, you don't have a vision. And if you don't have a vision, how can you build anything? How can you align a team around that? How can you get investors to want to be a part of what your journey is going to be? You have to think about story from day one. It sits at the very top, like it is at the top of the organization and it flows throughout. So the founder should be building out that story day one. It should be evolving over time. If you do this right, what happens is when you're talking to investors, like Tyler's saying, ahead of time, they get excited by your founder story and your vision story. The reality is if you don't have those things ready to go when you're meeting investors, that first interaction is a missed opportunity. That first impression that you're giving is not going to be one that's positive. You want an investor who is so excited about who you are as a founder and about what your potential vision is that they will back you even before you have the product, even before you have the idea, before you have revenue. And it continues to evolve over time. When you go to your series A, your series B, which is where I work with a lot of founders on is how do we make sure that those investors are excited about the story? They understand where you're coming from and where you're going. So like if you aren't constantly preparing that and prepping on it and working with it, I've got a founder right now who's a series B. We've worked on that story together every single week for two and a half years. Every single week for two and a half years, we have come together and worked on the story, evolving it and telling it the right way. And as a result, they've been able to go from C to series B and it's been effortless and the growth has followed because they can recruit people from it. They can get investors excited by it. And again, it sets the vision of what the product and what that end result is going to look like. So from my perspective, it's an ongoing day one to day IPO type of exercise. Is, is storytelling coachable? Like I, I'm, I'm hearing all that. I'm bought in, right? And I'm like, uh, maybe I'm a, a product or engineering minded founder. And I'm like, oh man, a lot of what you're saying makes me sound like I need to be extroverted or, or uh, have this really compelling pitch. Um, and I get that storytelling is important, but maybe it's not a skill set I have yet. Like. Is it, is it coachable? Uh, will it come out in diligence where an investor might be like, oh man, the, the, the founder is, is talented with a great background in the huge market, but the story sucks. Like, is that something I can learn and, and pick up and, and, and what have you seen work? Of course, storytelling is a skill, just like anything. You can learn it, you can develop it. There are frameworks and principles and ways to, to develop it. Like I, I did not speak like this when I first started. I always tell people I had a stutter and a lisp growing up. I was terrified, <laughs> terrified to speak. Like I hated my voice. I never wanted to speak up. And then I worked on it. 
I worked with the speech therapist to overcome those issues. And over time, just got better and better at this, ended up being a trial lawyer, ended up trying all those cases, ended up, you know, building an ed tech, having that acquired, do all the work I do now with competitive storytelling. So like, I've learned it, I've developed it, I continue to, to refine this. And the, the last thing I'll say on this is a lot of people will be like, well, I'm an introvert or, you know, I'm technical or whatever. And I thought there was a really interesting interview the other day from Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders said, I'm an introvert. And yet, if you looked at Dion's social media, you'd be like, that guy's an extrovert. Except he's not. He has a persona, which is prime. And when he goes into prime, that's the extrovert part. He turns it on. There's a switch. Beyonce has Sasha Fierce. There's an alternate ego that comes out because any founder can step into that role because a founder's job is to set the vision, is to make sure you have the capital you need in the bank, and then all to recruit great people. And that all comes from storytelling. So you can learn it. Steve Jobs didn't start as a great storyteller, but he turned himself into one. And anybody here can do the same thing. Yeah. I love that Coach Prime has crossed the chasm and is now in the uh, the startup zeitgeist, which is, which is, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a lot of great questions coming in. Uh, Dirk, Camilla, Theodore, Luke, I, I'm see, we're seeing them all, writing them down. Uh, I suspected this was going to happen. We had a lot of great questions. So I want to make sure we spend the next 10 or so minutes getting through the content and we'll come back to all of these questions um, to, to wrap things up. So uh, we're coming back to them. Don't, don't you worry. Um, we, we talked about uh, communication and, and building relationships and, and the importance of uh, investor updates. I don't want to be too self-serving here because um, I, I do think there's a lot of great ways you could do this. You don't have to use um, Visible at all for this. Uh, but I do want to talk about how you can leverage investor updates for fundraising and, and future rounds of financing. And I think, you know, the things that I've seen over the last seven plus years since starting Visible are kind of the, the three core problems with investor communication, um, which is one, simply founders just don't do it. Uh, we'll talk about what percentage of founders just don't do it. Um, founders don't really know how to even leverage their their stakeholders. I use stakeholders as is like, you know, your investors, your potential investors, um, advisors, people that are cheering you on. And then like the, if you are sending an update, the lack of consistent information that is, that is coming from that. Um, Tyler, to, to flip it over to you, like, I, I kind of, ha I have a hypothesis I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share here, but why do you think that founders are not great at communicating with their current or potential investors? Um, I mean, human error, right? Like, I think that it, it tracks very similarly to like all things in life, which is like, it's very easy to get distracted by the, the flashbang, like one-stop shop, like the one thing that will change whatever it is you want to change in life. Uh, and the reality is it's like most things are just doing the simple, boring stuff over and over again. Right. It's like, you know, we've all been there. I want to lose weight and you chase around like all these different magical solutions. And it's like, you know, eat less, walk more and just do that for a year and you'll get where you want. And people don't like that answer. It's just like, it's boring. Um, it, it, it takes a tremendous amount of discipline um, to do things that you don't want to do all the time. And, and I think it's with, you know, regular updates. Uh, it's the same. It's like, it's, it's boring. And the value comes from doing it over and over again consistently that's number one. Number two is um, <clears throat> I think that doing regular updates in a meaningful way means deciding on what is the important parts of your business to measure and measuring and reporting on them like win or lose. And so one thing I see founders do all the time is like every investor update is just like an amalgamation of whatever's going right that month, but there's no consistency from month to month. So it's like, you're not quantitatively measuring whether or not we're moving in the correct direction. You're just listing a bunch of things that went well this month and it's not really helping. It doesn't create a story one for the people following because there's no sort of narrative connection between whatever you um, write out that's going well versus last month. And it sort of forces founders to face the objective reality of like, sometimes things aren't working and it's nice to ignore it and pretend like, well, but all this other stuff is going really well. And it's like, yeah, but if, you know, user retention or revenue growth or contract value, whatever it is that you think your North Star is, if it's not going well, no amount of separate, you know, qualitative updates is going to change that number. So the second aspect of just kind of facing the music uh, and building the muscle 
it's a it's a cultural component because like the founders build a muscle of always being very quantitative and very objective like is what we're doing working and if not let's change that will precipitate down into the company if the founders never do that then you know everyone on the company will do the same it's like hey how are things going oh yeah good like here's a off the top of my head things that are positive and i'm ignoring the fact that like the underlying north star metrics are not going in the right direction so i think when you combine those two things like probably less than 10 percent of founders in the very beginning stages of building their company from like zero to getting close to being able to raise a series a actually develop out this like every single month sitting down measuring the business writing about what's going well and what's not going well deciding on what your plan is to fix anything that's not going well and then moving forward and executing um there there's like there's this temptation because it's self-narrated right of of mm -hmm. you know it's like we're an athlete but there's no television coverage we're gonna say what happened in the game afterwards so like i missed that free throw but it's like but i've got a couple seals right and it's like okay that's fine but like you still lost the game yeah. um so i think if founders can build this muscle it will serve them for the entire length of their company um one it'll help make them a much better founder and two i think it'll help instill a very powerful culture of quantitative objectivity around is what we're doing working and if not let's change it's totally fine if it's not working but let's make a change um and it creates a very powerful way to communicate and set yourself apart from investors right so you know if you're the average seed investor you you see a thousand plus pitch decks a year and everyone's pitch deck is awesome it's well designed whatever it has all these crazy stats and we're the best company in the whole world this and that blah blah um I, like no amount of work in a pitch deck is really going to set you apart if you for every month for six months send an investor hey here's what happened this month i remember i told you this is what we're tracking to see whether our business is working and here it is right in july and here it is in august and here it is in september and october and november right and december you are within the top 10 percent of companies to that investor just the fact that you're able to do that indicates you have a lot of really really hard to find things that that investors are looking for in founders you're consistent you're disciplined you're objective right like all those things are very hard to find um so being able to do that on a consistent basis in my opinion is a much more powerful indicator to investors of you as a founder than like some fancy pitch deck you spent 60 hours trying to make yeah, I, I think you everything you outlined there is is spot on. Uh, I think uh, Ray also mentioned this around this idea of like intimidation is is a factor. I think one of one of my my theories is that um, founders are just scared to share bad news, and usually it's like challenges are the thing you're always overcoming in a, in a startup, right? Like the there's maybe seldomly few great highlights and a lot of probably lowlights or just things that you're working through. Um, I personally think it's like when the sharing those challenges uh, the right way is probably maybe the most beneficial thing you can do in an investor update because they they've seen the movie before, so to speak, and you can jump in and help. But can you help put like some founders at ease, Tyler, just around like why you should think about sharing um, challenges in, in an investor update? Yeah, because I, I like it, it is the reality. Like any good investor knows that building a startup is really really hard, and that it's not going to be great all the time i mean like let's take a sports analogy right like let's imagine baseball because they play the most games in a season the team that wins the world series at the end of a baseball season has a season where they lost 80 plus games right like they didn't it's not there's no there's never ever even been close to an undefeated team in the mlb everyone understands that it's a game of margins right and you have to win a game when it really matters and that there are going to be losses and you have to walk them off and keep your head up high and just keep moving forward. Um, so I think founders psych themselves out about everything needing to be perfect all the time and don't focus enough on what's hard to find as an investor are founders who are going to face that music, right? Again, it goes mm -hmm. into this self-reporting aspect of like, if you lose a game, tell, tell your investors you lost a game and then tell me how you're going to win the next game, right? Like keep showing up uh, keep staying objective, keep being honest about what's working and not working. Um, and you really set yourself apart. Like, I mean, look, building a startup is, the, is one of the only careers that rewards you being successful by getting harder, right? Like, <laughs> 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 like 
uh, objectively, this phase of the company is going to be the easiest phase of the company. Once you get to Series A, Series B, you have big inv- you have an investor who's put fifty million dollars, a hundred million dollars into the company. The conversations you're going to be having with them are going to be mostly negative, right? Of like, hey, we just lost our biggest customer and we are at risk of losing other customers. We need to act, right? Or an executive from the team is stepping down. It's going to be a PR nightmare, right? Or COVID just happened and we're in the travel business. And we're absolutely screwed, right? Like it's going to get harder. And most of your conversations with investors are going to be challenging conversations. So being open and honest about it in the beginning and showing that A, you can handle it as a founder, B, that you're going to be honest and not keep moving the goalposts so that things always seem positive. And C, again, that you're just going to do the boring, not exciting stuff consistently over and over again, like sitting down and spending two hours writing a monthly update with the same metrics the same measurements that you did last month and just being honest about where you're at. So yeah, I, 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 I think at this stage, it's such a powerful thing to do because it sets you apart from so many other founders who are just too lazy to do this. And number two, it shows an investor that like I am prepared as a founder to handle how much harder this job is going to get if we are successful. Yep, 100%. I uh, couldn't, couldn't say anything better there myself. So we're going to move on. And I want to make sure we get to, to some of Robbie's slides as well, and we'll end with with some Q and A. Um, this is a uh, this is from Hustle Fund, uh, and Elizabeth Ian, and, and she mentioned like we, uh, Tyler just mentioned ten percent by Series A, um, and and doing it the right way, like the same metrics and in, in the right format and all that. And this is Hustle Fund saying like they don't even hear from sixty percent, so they didn't hear from over half of their portfolio anything on a quarterly basis. Um, Again, that just tells me there's some massive arbitrage for you as a founder um, if you do this well um, to, to stick out right, and stand out, right? Because there are other founders who are not doing this, um, and especially if it's harder to fundraise now than it was two years ago. Uh, it's, it's another great quiver you can put in your, into your tool set. Um, and, and another just data point to drive this home is um, Elizabeth mentioned that if you don't write regular updates, your investors don't want to help you, um, which is true, right? It's like hard to put your own social political capital online, you have no idea what's going on uh, with, with your own portfolio company. Um, Tyler already mentioned these, so I'll, I'll just give this a quick um, glance. And again, we'll include all this content for everyone after, um, but just keeping things comparable in the same metrics every time. Like don't cherry pick whatever happens to be the best metric each update. You're not fooling anyone um, and you're really hurting yourself and, and your credibility and you're not um, really gonna affect change if you're not actually using the same metrics every single week, month, quarter. Um, the other thing I always see is like always including growth and absolute numbers together, you know, saying, hey, we went from one to two dollars doesn't mean a whole lot. And also saying grew 100 percent doesn't mean much without the two together. Um, so if you're, you are bringing the quantitative element to this, making sure that you're using both growth and, and absolute numbers. And then finally, uh, I think like one of the the big we talk, we talk about lines and not dots. It's from like a, a Mark Schuster post from a while back with this idea that like, you know, your job as a founder is really to build um, relationships with potential investors over time and even putting them on an update uh, that if they're not investors yet is going to help you build that muscle and rapport with that investor um, to help them communicate with you or sorry, to help you, you know, build that, the, that build that relationship. So um, I'm a huge fan of it. I want to make sure we give uh, Robbie some airtime before we, we wrap up, though. Um, so I'm going to move ahead here. Um, and we got a template, by the way, so we'll make sure to send this out. But uh, we have a consistent template. We have the Antler template, which we'll highlight that all of the Antler, uh, Antler companies are using. Um, and, and you can browse our whole library on our site and grab whatever you need um, um, for that. Um, so I'm going to uh, fast forward here to the whole idea of storytelling, make sure we can wrap up here with some really compelling and, I think, helpful um, content and crafting um, your two most important stories. And so. Uh, let me get to the next slide here. Um, we talk about storytelling. I guess you know, Robbie. Um, why why does storytelling matter? We we touched on this a little bit already. Um, you know, what are investors looking for in twenty twenty three? And then maybe wrapping up this slide with like the common mistakes that you see founders use when they're storytelling. Yeah. So I mean, we know why it matters. From uh, what are they looking for? They're looking for a a founder who is able to articulate the thing that they're working on and is going to be able to attract other investors, talent, and customers onto that movement. 
at the end of the day, right? And that really is what it comes down to. Can you make what you're building sound exciting to the normal person, right? Not speaking in technical jargon, not speaking in buzzwords, not making it where it's so opaque or boring. They, they want to see, do you have the ability to lead people? That, that is what storytelling comes down to. And so when we see the common mistakes, the common mistakes are just founders giving a bunch of facts, figures, numbers, and thinking that that makes it a story or telling, reciting your resume. That's not a story. A story takes someone on a journey. It's emotional. It has rises and falls. Going back to the idea of sharing your, your struggles and your losses and your failures. Nobody wants to hear a story that starts with, they inherited a bunch of money and their life was amazing. And it just kept getting more amazing. They got the best job. Then they married their dream girl. Then life continued to be great. They had amazing kids. They made more money and happily ever after. Like no one wants to hear that story. What they want to hear is the challenges, the hard parts, you overcoming it because it shows that you can overcome adversity. So the common mistakes I would say is not leaning into the, the, the true story of who you are. I always say the job of storytelling is to open up your brain so they can see how you think your eyes so they can see how you see the world and your heart and soul so they can see how you feel about things. It's a very vulnerable activity. And most founders don't get nearly vulnerable enough or raw enough to really pull people into that, into that movement they're creating. What about kind of common mistakes then? Um, if I am, you know, uh, you're seeing as someone's trying to, to tell their story, is it, is it simply just that founders are not doing it and being vulnerable enough? Is that the, the big mistake? That's the big one. They also tend to word vomit and just ramble and go all over the place. There's no structure. There's no thought process behind what they're saying. So every meeting they go into, it's a different story, which is, is terrible. How can you tell what's working if you tell a different thing every single time? And it's because they haven't put in the practice ahead of time. This goes back to the idea of what does prep look like? And I always think about it from a sports metaphor as well. I was, I was an athlete, so forgive me for using lots of sports. That's probably why I bring... a. Uh, Dion into this, but there's off season, there's preseason, there's regular season, and there's the playoffs. And the way that you prepare in those first two phases is going to lead to your success in the regular season, which I would consider the first meetings with an investor. The playoffs is when you get into second and third and really diligence phase. So founders don't prepare. They just go into fundraising and they're like, well, I built a deck. And like my deck tells a story. And I'm like, your deck doesn't tell anything. Your, your, your deck is pretty visual. It's like, Tyler said, they see a thousand of them. They all look nice. So how do you stand out? You stand out by connecting on an emotional level and having a conversation. This is why I call it conversational storytelling. So uh, that would be some of the, the mistakes that I see. Yeah. Okay, cool. We're going to know how to do this too, which is, which is yep. great. Um, so what are the types of stories? How do you deliver them? How do you craft them? And what is like competitive, competitive and conversational storytelling? So quickly, these are the two core stories that I think every founder needs. It is your origin story. This is where you share three things. What makes you special, how you got here, and why you care. Those three pieces, if you answer them and put them into a story, it will deliver. The second story is the future story. This is the vision, the biggest, boldest, most ambitious vision that you have. What it looks like in five, 10 years when everything goes right. So that you can show the, the second and third order consequences as well and really make it feel real. This is where you have investors pull themselves into that vision. Chris Saka talked about this when he talked to the Instagram founders. When they, when they pitched him, they were already talking so far in the future about all the users they had on board that he felt like it had already happened, even though it was years away from that actually coming true, which pulled him into the deal because he said, these guys know something that I don't. They're so sure that this is happening that they want to do this. And this is why I have the graphic here. You tell the origin story, your founder origin story, and then you say, this is where we're going. Let me paint the picture of the future. And you leave a lot of this space in between open because it's really hard to say exactly how you're going to get from C to series B. It's very hard to say how you're going to get from series B to series C. If you were building before COVID, you would have never expected COVID to happen. So you would have been wrong if you were saying, here's how we're going to get from C to series A when COVID hits and all of a sudden everything shuts down. So you have to give the investor enough room to let their imagination play. And this is why I call it emotional storytelling. And the way you deliver it is like a conversation, like you're having a beer or you're having coffee with someone and it's an old friend. They say, Tyler, tell me about what you're building there at Antler. Tyler's like, Robbie, I'd love to tell you. Like we have this 
huge idea that we think we can pull off. And then we would go into it. He would just tell me like a conversation. So this is really where it comes down to those two pieces. Obviously, there's a lot more to this in terms of crafting the story. But if you answer those three core questions for your founder story, it'll put you in a good place. If you think about what's the biggest, boldest, most ambitious vision of your future, that will help you to start defining what that future story looks like. Now, there's data numbers, there's proof points that we put in to make it feel more tangible and more real. But uh, that's kind of the crux of it. And what competitive storytelling is, it's just what I found in a courtroom. I told a story. If I told a better story, I won. And in the cases I was trying, I was trying murders, cartel cases, child abuse cases. I couldn't lose. I couldn't afford to. And so it's the same game, though, that founders are playing. Can you tell the best story? Because Tyler at Antler is hearing 10 other stories today. Are, are you going to stand out? That's really what it comes down to. Can you make him go home at night and say, I can't stop thinking about what Mike told me, what he's building that future. I have to be a part of it. You're really essentially incepting them. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, it's, oh, go ahead, Tyler. Well, I was going to add one thing because I think you can reconcile everything that Robbie and I are talking about, which may seem like separate concepts, right? But if you look at this graphic, it's a perfect visualization. So you nail your origin story. There's a ton of powerful things that come out of being able to tell people, uh, like Robbie said, where did you come from? Um, you know, why are you here and why do you care? And then the future story for a VC, I think one of the important parts is let's assume that 90 percent of founders are first time founders is the last missing piece is okay you have an amazing vision right your babe roof you stepped up into the box and you pointed to the outfield right now hit the ball and that is the sending a monthly update showing that you, that line there that's going up into the right showing investors that you're plotting along that line right like I've, there's plenty of times where you've met a founder they can tell this amazing story of how they imagine the future but then you know eight months later it's just flat like all they've done is like go flat underneath the circle so execution is a really important part of this and that's where i think over the you know look if we're honest about from the time you first meet a vc to raising a seed round you're probably going to spend six to eight months right building the relationship etc you get them hooked with an amazing origin story right you get them thinking about you with an amazing future story. And then over the course of those six to eight months, you show them, I keep plotting updates on this line, right? We are making progress towards the future that I told you we we're going to build. And it becomes to the point where like all the best rounds I've ever seen, the investors come to the founders, right? Founders and, and Robbie can corroborate on this. It's like you send a monthly update. And then at a certain point, you start to see investors like, hey, when are you raising your next round? Right. Hey, have you thought about bringing on capital? I mean, I've had investors say like, I want to give you money right now. Don't even go out and raise. I don't want you to talk to any other investors. And so to reconcile all those three things together, I think you get a really compelling strategy on what founders should focus on, which is the storytelling, get them locked in, get them hooked, show them why you're here and why you're here for the right reasons, and then show them consistently that you're plotting on that line and executing and staying focused and being objective. And what happens- yes. Quickly, what happens on that line is as you get closer, the future story becomes like your IPO date. And as you keep moving, you're essentially showing them you're getting closer and closer to that throughout time to Tyler's point. So your series A is going to be further up that line. Your series B is going to be further up that line. So you're constantly showing the execution story, which would be the third story that you tell around the metrics that Tyler was, was highlighting there. Yeah. Is that idea of uh, you're always fundraising, uh, but you're never fundraising, right? If you, if you, if you pull it off the right way, um is is that idea that, uh, there uh, i want to get to this um the journey to mastery and, and refining the narrative and and just kind of going through this this view here that you have robbie and you can just walk founders through like if you're working with the founder obviously you just mentioned you're working with someone for for years um so we're not you know we're not gonna be able to spend uh, two years with you today but like that concept of of journey and into my mastery and and what this this u-shape um framework actually actually means yeah, so I'll, I'll go into this. I mean, just for, for context for anyone, the, the founders I've worked with have raised over $600 million in capital. And I see this exact same line play out with every single one of them going through this process. When we start, if I ask anyone here to tell their story, it would sound natural, but sloppy. And I can guarantee it. I don't care how good you are at storytelling. It will sound sloppy to me. 
And what will happen though, is we'll build out the story. What happens anytime you build out a story is you start feeling like it's less natural because it feels more rehearsed. You're essentially creating a script, if you will. And so you go down this U shape and you get towards the bottom. And the bottom is where a lot of people give up. They're like, screw it. It's not worth it. I don't like this. This feels, this feels terrible. And you're right. It does feel terrible. <laughs> but it's because what you've gone from is, is now you are no longer as natural, but it's getting more polished. And so it does sound rehearsed. When I have a founder tell it to me, it sounds rehearsed. It sounds like they're being an actor, but it's polished. And once they have it fully memorized and it starts to take on that polish, then it goes from being memorized to internalized. And when they internalize a story, now they take full ownership over it. At the end of the day, it is your story. So you do get the right to internalize it and take ownership over it. And then they start coming out of the U shape and they go up to that top right. So then all of a sudden it sounds both polished and natural. I could wake them up in the middle of the night and they could deliver the story in the exact right way. And they can do it in a repeatable way. So we can test and see what's working. So we can really figure out what are the high points, what are the low points, where can we make some changes? And that's really what that mastery is all about. This is why I always say the best impromptu speakers are never speaking impromptu. They're always prepared. They're always ready. It sounds like they're impromptu, but they never are because they've done all this work to get to mastery. So it sounds impromptu, but it's not at all. And that's really what it takes to get to that mastery. That's a, a great way to end uh, this session. Uh, I wanna spend five minutes on Q and A um, as we wrap up. And if we don't get to your question, I wrote down everyone's name here. So uh, we can try to get back to you through, through email as well. Um, let's start with Dirk uh, and, and Robbie, maybe we'll start with you. Like, What's the right way to create FOMO um, as it relates to, you know, building invest, investor relationships, right? Because um, I think there's like the, we're raising around term sheets are, you know, we're going to close this round in two weeks. And and now you can call BS on that in, in today's market. Like, what's the right way to build FOMO? It's not to artificially force it and try to uh, to, to make an investor fall, fall for your games. What it is, you create FOMO by demonstrating that you are truly an exceptional founder. Right. And that means showing that you can execute, showing that you are top 1% of 1%. It's something in your life. Like you've been obsessed with something. You've done something great. Showing that you have true founder market fit, showing that you can recruit great people. Like all of these things create FOMO because, like, that's a great founder. What's going to succeed in the market? A great founder. So that really is, is how I think about creating FOMO is make sure that it is so apparent when an investor meets you that you are the type that will go the distance, that you will work 20 years, run through 7,000 walls, that you will knock over every obstacle and somehow still get to that big exit that an investor wants. To me, that's how you create FOMO. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to try to rip through these because we have three minutes left. Jerome asked, how important are financial models for fundraising? And should I use a consultant for this? Um, Tyler, I'll, I'll flip that one to you. No, I mean, don't use a consultant, right? I mean, I think that, Financial models are important in the sense of a VC assessing how clear can a founder think about the business. The actual numbers inside a financial model for a seed company are all made up. I mean, the the you know the amount of historical data. Look, public traded companies predict the future of their business on a quarterly basis and regularly miss. So, like, there's no expectation that you're going to predict the future. So, I, I think that you're you're sort of you're doing the wrong thing if you bring in a separate party to do that. As a VC, what I want to understand is how deeply have the founders thought about the ins and outs of this actual model? And can we sit down and have a conversation about, well, what if this changes, then how does that affect your model, right? Or what if you're wrong about this assumption or this and that? So, you know, and you have to, where there is oftentimes a power dynamic that founders are just going to have to rep their way through is like, a lot of good VCs spend all day talking through business models. They have a lot of experience in what works, what doesn't work. Uh, how does this affect this, blah, blah, blah. So um, yeah, you need to know this stuff cold. And again, not the numbers, but the actual model. How does, how does your unit economics affect the overlying business? At what point can you start scaling without increasing cash burn? Um, you know, are, are you being realistic about assumptions about your variable cost? Like as a founder, it's part of your job to, you know, show 
maybe not expertise, but show dedication to really caring about that stuff. So definitely don't bring in a third party to do that. It's, it's accomplishing the exact opposite of what you should be focused on, which is don't worry so much about the numbers, worrying about understanding the model and the inputs and outputs. Yep, I think that's, that's very sage advice. Um, Robbie, Taro just asked us, do you have some examples of a great founder story you could share? Anything come to mind? There, I, I mean, Brian Chesky does a great founder origin story. Like I broke down his story that he did recently at the uh, Config conference. So, I mean, that's that's one that I would point to. Obviously, it's easier to do it when you're looking in reverse than when sure. you're in the moment. Um, but his is a beautiful example of what a great one looks like. And then, you know, there's there's other ones as well. The company that raised Rewind recently uh, raised a, a fairly large round. Dan does a pretty good job of his founder origin story that he shared publicly as well. Um, so that would be another one that you could check out. Okay, awesome. Um, and we'll just wrap up this one. I think this one's this one's great since we had, a, as we saw, we had a pretty wide audience as we joined. Um, would you advise starting with contacting venture investors in your region or should you go global from day one? Uh, I think that's a great question from Theodore. Uh, Tyler, I know you've, you've started in Singapore and are here. Do you have any kind of takes on how you should think about building relationships locally versus globally? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I mean, I, like, Yeah, I think, I mean, going globally from day one, there is an aspect of just like relevance, right? Like, you know, there, you, you have to have some compelling reason to just sit down and have a, you know, 20 minute chat with an investor. And if you're building a company in um, Singapore and you're reaching out to an investor in uh, the US, um, there may be too big of a gap there before you've, you know, actually proven something um, and gotten some traction, et cetera. But uh, I don't think it hurts to try, you know, I, and I think ultimately like the founders getting out and starting to realize that you're, you're the founder of the company. Like the entire company is you. It's, it's like, whatever happens is all you for better or worse. And so um, I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, building a list of here, are all the investors that over the course of the next 10 years, I would love to speak with and have an opportunity to raise money from. I'm just going to start shooting my shot and reaching out to them and seeing how I can get introed and sitting down and having a chat and saying, Hey, here's what I'm doing. Um, building that connection, keeping them updated. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, like I, I wouldn't do it to the extent that you feel like it's like majorly distracting you from what should be the main focus, which is speaking to your customers. Um, but again, I think that like, what founders underestimate, I guess, I'll, I'll make this my closing point. The point that I'm trying to make is founders underestimate how many VCs are out there that are going to be relevant to you over the course of the company. And for any one company, it's maybe 100 VCs. And if you're actually going to bring a, a, a category defining company to life, you're going to meet those 100 VCs at some point. And they're, they're going to be on your cap table or they're going to regret that they weren't on your cap table. So you know, the earlier you can start figuring out ways to meet them and talk to them and start to have the ability to tell your story. Like one of the really powerful things to Robbie's point on storytelling is like the market only has a fixed amount of attention and stories, good stories end up dominating the attention sphere. And it, 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 it compounds back into, it creates this like inevitability of a company being successful is like, their story wins, right? It's like people know their story. Like Airbnb is such a good example. It's like everyone on this call knows the uh, serial story, right? Yeah. It's like they won. Like they became part of the startup zeitgeist. They have solidified themselves in the history of venture capital, not because of their metrics, but because of the story. It resonated so deeply with everyone of the scrappiness. And, you know, it's like, we didn't know how we were going to survive. So we started selling cereal and all that. So the faster you can get out into the market and start telling and refining your stories and 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 capturing some of the market share of the the VC world's attention, um, I think the better. So like I don't think it's a question of you know global or local. I think it's a question of like these are the hundred investors who I'm going to have to compete for my story in my category to be the winning story. And the earlier I can get a head start on that, the better. Yeah, that that was an amazing way to end it. Um, that was that was so fantastic. Robbie and Tyler, I can't thank you guys enough for joining us today. 
uh, and everyone for the questions. That was, it was a great conversation. I wrote down all the questions. We'll, we'll try to include these in our wrap up um, email as well. So if we didn't get to your question, we'll, we'll put it back in, in email. Um, and thanks everyone for joining and uh, we'll see everyone uh, hopefully soon. Thanks, thanks so much, getting it together and great to meet everyone and I uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Uh, see you, everyone.